So I am uh, Matt Lancaster. I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, automating performance optimization. So um, it's a topic sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, so I think the first question that should probably pop into all of your heads is, who is the giant bearded man talking to me? And why does he have any authority to talk about this topic whatsoever? So um, let me just give you a brief intro to who I am and why I'm talking about this topic. So um, I am a senior technology architect and a uh, executive within Accenture's um, emerging technologies practice where I lead up a practice area called lightweight architectures. Um, specifically, I own a capability group called the Accenture Open Web Platform that, that I started um, and I currently lead a team of about uh, 50 people um, in the United States and another few hundred people offshore, um, various projects around the world. I have a lot of battle scars. Um, we can compare if anybody has some, some cool battle scars. Um, not real battle scars, technically. But um, in any case, um, you know, we've got a, got a lot, of, uh, lot of project experience doing client-side applications. Um, and a lot of that has been you know, for our, our enterprise clients. And in many cases, those tend to be large applications or, or large projects. And a lot of that, um, you know, we have performance SLAs. We have a lot of things that we have to meet. Um, so, you know, you you, you tend to get uh, you tend to get pretty um, either jaded pretty quickly, or um, you tend to get smart pretty quickly on how to uh, eke as much performance as possible out of applications. So, um, part of the platform that we've created is is uh, you know how to. Um, get as much of the performance tasks done as we can in an automatic fashion um, so that we can get them, uh, so that we can focus on the things that you still have to do manually. So like any good consultant, I have an agenda here that I'm going to completely ignore. So um, to skip to the disclaimers and caveats before we actually get into the real presentation. So the first disclaimer here is that uh, is one that should be obvious to all of us since we're all developers. Um, and you know, I gave my, my, my you know, self-flagellating executive bio there, but I still code, you know, every week. So, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I, I definitely uh, sling JavaScript occasionally, though I, I think a couple of folks in the audience who are on my team would probably uh, tell you that I inflict my JavaScript upon other people rather than, uh, um, you know, actually put it out there in the world, but that's um, for, for them to say. Um, but So great performance still requires great code. That's never going to change. So it doesn't matter what you know, automated or non-automated steps that you're doing. It um, doesn't matter really what you do. Is if you don't have great code, you're never going to get great performance. And if you don't have great code, all of your users are going to leave, and your clients are going to leave you in the dust. And if you're, you're lucky if they don't leave you beaten in a dumpster somewhere. So. Um, you know, have great code, right? And just a quick aside on that, um, since, you know, we're all in, in sort of a wave of popularity in, in the JavaScript world, um, and we're, we're finally achieving the level of limelight that, that we all deserve in this application space with Node.js, with the rise of single page applications, um, with all of that, I think those of you in the in the startup space have been in that for a long time. Those of us who are, who are in enterprise and consulting are, you know, catching up. Um, but um, you know, be kind to the friends who are coming over from other languages, but don't let them um, code other languages in JavaScript. I see in code reviews almost weekly a lot of Java written in JavaScript, and I think as we all know and we probably got from the EMCA Script 6 talk earlier that object-oriented programming in JavaScript is a special butterfly. And inflicting Java-based class structures on JavaScript is a good way to violate disclaimer number one and get really awful code really quickly. So disclaimer number two is that uh, automated performance optimization is not just an asset pipeline. If we, I think, what you know, one of the things that I take out of this quickly 
is that if we're just doing concatenation, minification, that's a foundational step. That's, we all should be doing that. If you're not doing that, get out of here and go do it for your projects. If you, if you have code on production websites that's not minified and not concatenated into as, as few files as possible, then you're probably doing something wrong, right? And the number, disclaimer number three is that you cannot automate all of performance optimization. We should all take that as a given, right? You, but you can automate some very important things. Um, you can automate um, some, you know, tasks that we have, you know, that, that we've traditionally done manually. You can automate some things that uh, we, it, we've spent a lot of time on so that you can spend time diagnosing other problems and in many cases problems that are going to take a lot more manual time to solve. So, you know, one of, one of the things that, that people pro are probably tired of hearing me say on a daily basis is that, uh, you know, the first rule of triage is that, you treat, is, is that you treat the severe but quickly manageable wounds first. If you have a, a patient with, you know, stage three, stage four cancer, um, if they die of a gunshot wound, you'll never get the chance to treat the cancer, right? So if you have a bunch of unoptimized images on a website and you have, you know, a bunch of network problems, you better optimize the images first before you fix all your network problems, right? Otherwise, the, your client is going to kick you out for, um, you know, violating SLAs long before you can treat the larger problems. And, you know, the, the caveat here is that uh, premature optimization um, is mostly bad. You know, if you, if you take nothing else from the talk, you'll have a, a little sort of architecture angel that kind of looks like me, which will be scary sitting on your shoulder at some point, saying that uh, you know, premature optimization is mostly bad. So if you start adding caching layers to an overall system architecture for no reason, you know, that's terrible. But uh, you know, sometimes it's not bad. You know, when, we, when we know things like, once again, image optimization, which is one of my favorite things to pick on because it's something that I, I tend to see people not do quite a bit, um, we know that uh, you know, sending non-optimized, non-compressed images out there into the wild is always a bad thing, right? If you have images that you haven't run through an optimization algorithm and, and you just throw, that out there, throw those out there in the wild, that's download speeds or that's download time that you're, that you're inflicting upon users, right? So you can do that. It's not premature optimization because you know you're just doing a good thing. So all that being said, what is automated client performance optimization. So I think the answer is pretty germane, right? The answer is the same stuff that we've always been doing with, with optimization on the client side. Um, it's just throwing a couple of, uh, uh, you know, little, little um, wrinkles into it. So reducing file sizes, reducing the number of files that are downloaded, reducing render time, improving the performance of the code, you know, cue dramatic music automatically. Right, um, and then you know what is the the scope of this activity, and uh, that is uh, you know doing uh, performance related tuning, um, and and doing the activities and setting that up in, into a build build task using an, a task automation or build automation tool. So why would ever would we want to do this? so that we can use an excuse other than my code's compiling since we're all writing things in dynamic languages, right? We can't use that excuse, so now we have a build tool that'll run for a long time so that we can do chair sword fighting, which would be awesome. So, um, not really, you know, we, we, we want to inflict really awesome applications on people as opposed to slow applications. So let's define a methodology for actually doing this. Um, you know, so let's think through the, the, the pieces of our applications that are going to cause us problems, right? So one of the things that always jumps out at me first is how many, if we, if we open up the Google Chrome, or we open up the Chrome Web Tools or, the, or Firebug or what have you, how many unused CSS rules do we have in the average application that we write? Um, how many of you guys are, are building applications right now that has between 
50 and 70% of the CSS is unused. Fewer hands than I would have thought. Okay, between 40 and 70%. Okay, more hands. So, um, you know, not so responsive images on a responsive site, um, you know, wh where you're loading desktop size images on a mobile device, um, or just non-optimized images, um, you're, you have multiple media query definitions, many, many more things, right? So we, t we list these things out. We can generally list them in the order of severity so that we can, once again, go through that triage process. And then once we have that list of things that we need to actually work through, we can list those by priority. And then we actually set some folks out to tackle them. So how would we solve that? Well, if we're going to automate it, we should probably use the right set of tools, right? We should use. Uh, some, some good task automation tools, and in the JavaScript space today, that is grunt or gulp, right? Or something else, you know, broccoli or brunch or one of the 10 million other tools. I think there were a couple of other talks based on those. Um, for the purposes of my talk here, it'll be grunt or gulp. Um, I have a list of all the tasks at the end of the presentation. So, um, you know, and what, uh, and I think, Equally importantly to the things that can be automated is what can't be automated and what, uh, what we can do in an automated fashion to help humans along in, in performing those tasks. So one of the things that I think, I, you know, becoming probably a theme in my, my discussion here is that uh, I'm a big fan of uh, code review. I like to, uh, like to make people get code reviewed, 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 reviewed. Right, so you'll 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 hear me say that again and again. So keep that in mind. Um, so tools of the trade, we have uh, fantastic icons there. Gotta love the warthog. Um, for the for the Java folks, I always tend to to say that Grunt is kind of the uh, the maven of the JavaScript world, and Gulp is kind of the Gradle. Right, it's kind of no longer the case, but Grunt is configuration-based. Gulp is kind of a, a scripting-based approach. There, there used to be, up until, what was it, like three or four months ago, the, the, the chief difference was that uh, Gulp could handle tasks concurrently or asynchronously, and Grunt couldn't. The teams collaborated and fixed, those, fixed that problem. So now they can both handle things concurrently. So pick your poison, whichever one works. Um, Grunt does tend to have a few more tasks out there, so um, I tried in the spirit of, of equanimity here to have or to list tasks for both libraries, um, but sometimes I could only find one for Grunt or what have you, so I only listed those. And then I list Fabricator here because it's my favorite code review tool. Um, it's also the most sarcastic enterprise tool I've found in existence. Anytime where there's, a, there's an item in a workflow where you're closing a code review out of spite, I think it's automatically awesome. So if you haven't checked out Fabricator, check it out. Um, so let's, let's move into JavaScript. Um, when, we're, when we're optimizing JavaScript in, uh, in, in our pipeline here, obviously we're all here, we're all JavaScript developers. This is the hardest one to actually do any sort of automated optimization on or automated um, performance optimization. So the best we can do is run it through a series of static code quality checks, right? And the love it or hate it, JS hint tends to be the number one um, in that list. Um, there's a, an up and comer that I actually like quite a bit called ESLint. Um, I don't know if anybody, anybody heard of ESLint or used it. Show of hands. Wow, nobody. So ESLint allows for custom rule sets, which I think is kind of nifty, because you can add a bunch of, uh, a bunch of custom rules per project. Um, there's another one that I like called JSCS, which allows you to have team-specific code style guides, um, not, and not like creative style guides, but you know, how many um, tabs do you, do you like per, or how many spaces do you like per tab Stuff, or, or do, you, do you like to cuddle brackets and things like that? Um, 
what have you. Um, so embedding these tasks, you know, we're all perfect coders, of course, so we never make any, any standard you know, j mistakes that JS Hint can fix, of course. But uh, embedding these tasks within our build processes can, can help you know, fix any of the novice errors, especially as we bring some of those developers that are coming over from other languages or that are on larger teams embedding them in the standard build processes as well as embedding them into uh, our continuous integration processes. And then also, uh, once again, um, you know, setting up code review as part of our build process or as part of our development process, right? Um, if we have a working branch that we're all developing on or that f folks are developing a feature on, before it gets back into the development branch, somebody has to review it. Having a process like that where you, where you get it back into the sprint branch, branch or back into master and a code review has to be performed before it gets back in there, it works wonders on code quality. Right? And having that process set up in an automated fashion where pe you know, people get emails if that doesn't happen um, will we'll perform magic and unicorns will fly out of uh, you know, random places. So, um, you know, and then, you know, performing a lot of, uh, that, that's about as, as close as you can get with JavaScript. Most of the, the, uh, the tasks are, are relatively manual. So let's flip over to CSS where we can actually do a lot more in an automated fashion. So um, before we actually begin with CSS, and I'll, I'll speed up on the, the uh, clock here because I know we're probably all hungry. Um, all of the, the stuff that I'm going to talk about with CSS requires a little bit of pre-planning. So if anybody uses like the, the, if you're building small projects, you probably use like Yeoman generators and things like that. Um, a lot of the standard folder structures that those create for you aren't particularly modular and they're not uh, particularly well optimized for large projects. So um, if you, you probably have to think about uh, restructuring the folder structures a little bit for some of this stuff to work. And if you have a larger project, um, the grunt or gulp files are gonna get a little complex when you're, when you're building these automated processes into it. So I've been forewarned. Um, so, um, and then when, you, when you're actually doing these following a specific order, you know, picking your CSS preprocessor of choice um, performing the optimization tasks and then doing your CSS minification. So um, when you have CSS rules that are only used on, a, on, on one page or on a couple pages, do, making those, you have, there's an automated task um, called grunt contrib inline CSS where you can uh, make those, automatically inline those CSS rules. So instead of, you know, attaching a bunch of CSS files and waiting for that to load in the head. You just inline that CSS. It makes it run a little bit faster. Um, once again, it requires a little bit of pre-planning because you have to separate those rules out and make sure that they're, at they're attached in their own files. Um, and then, of course, if you, if you want to ratchet up the danger a little bit, you can use something called un-CSS, which uh, um, is you know, very, very powerful but comes with a lot of risk in that um, since we're at a jQuery conference, of course, all, all the CSS rules that are added by JavaScript on CSS doesn't detect. So you have to make sure that those are in the ignore file. But if you, uh, if you do it right, it will remove all the completely unused CSS, which, you know, if you have Bootstrap or if you have Foundation or if you have jQuery UI and you're not using a bunch of the, the stuff in there, it'll just completely remove it from the, from the, the, built, the built project. Um, and you'll have, uh, you know, in many cases, a, a pretty drastic change. I've seen up to 150 KB removed from a project, which is quite a bit of CSS rules that are not necessary um, getting removed. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, to my favorite task here, um, optimizing images. So um, I actually have one of my day jobs is at, at, at a media client where they have, uh, a home page that has about three megs of images on the home page, or at least it had three megs of images. We got that down to about 800 KB with, a, uh, with, a, with an optimization task built into their build process. 
Um, it, it, it increased the hit rate on the home page significantly. Um, you know, just through adding a single grunt task, right? So, so some of this stuff is it can can produce you know magical benefits if you if you give it a chance. So, and the you know since it's a media client and a very very creative heavy client at that, I hasten to add that images run through the um, algorithms that these that that this uh, the tasks use. Um, are pretty much indistinguishable from images that haven't been run through these algorithms, right? And they're actually reduced in many cases between, you know, 10 and 60 percent in file size. So, when when, when I have creative directors where, where they're taking the uh, taking the image versus the source um, PNG and, and taking a look at it on a on a big Thunderbolt monitor and, and zooming in. To massive sizes, and I'm like, huh, I can't tell any difference. There's no color washout. I tend to consider that a pretty, pretty big success of the of the algorithm. So um, they they liked it enough to put it into the process. So um, big win there. Um, so making images or making responsive images automatically is another uh, another item that you can you can do in this process. Um, if you have a responsive site. Um, this actually requires a little bit of uh, configuration, but once it's done, it works pretty well in that you define the responsive sizes, you define the breakpoints, and then you add the desktop size images. It creates a bunch of smaller images for you automatically so that when your site hits those breakpoints or somebody connects from a mobile device, let's say, um, you get the smaller images to load automatically. You don't have to have somebody go create a bunch of small images which, you know, if you have a fairly large project, oftentimes they don't get created or they get skipped. Um, somebody's not checking if they're created. It can cause performance issues on mobile. And the mobile users nowadays are the last folks we want to lose out on. The, the last task here is uh, related to sprites um, or related to web fonts, right? Um, icon sets are something that uh, Traditionally, we created sprites to, to handle icon sets. So we can create sprites automatically with, with a grunt task. Or we can take SVG icons and then create a, a web font from those and do virtually the same thing. Um, there are tasks to do that as well. Um, I actually like the web, web font approach because it uh, it's, can perform very, very well if done right. So. If you combine all of these things together, you, you actually get a, very, uh, get a very powerful approach. And once you combine JavaScript, CSS, images, it allows you to focus on some of these code review items. If we, uh, if we actually start using things like ESLint to their advantage, um, we can start writing custom rules to make sure that people use the right uh, local storage. Since I only had a 30-minute talk, I don't have all the graphs in this presentation, but uh, if you look at local store versus index DB, this has actually been fixed to some degree in the latest Chrome, latest Firefox, but local storage still performs by about a, a, an order of magnitude better than index DB. It used to be about three orders of magnitude about four browser versions ago. So if you, if you think about that, um, you know, which would you rather have, you know, a, f a few thousand sto stored items or a few million stored items, right, per second. Um, the HTML5 application cache is pure evil in terms of performance. Everything sticks in the damn cache, and it's impossible to get anything out of there. You always, everything always serves from the cache. Um, if, I, if I end up writing um, coding standards guides for a project, I usually have a few pages dedicated directly to how people can use the application cache, or more precisely, how people can't use the application cache. So this is one of the manual items that, that tends to get a lot more attention when, you, when you're um, focused on the automated items a little bit more. And then if you, if you think about it, we were talking about promises a little bit earlier. There's another couple talks on, on, on how we do API calls. Um, Making HTTP calls is enormously expensive as, as, a, uh, as a network transaction. So just batch them if you can. 
right? So creating an API object, add, add some calls to it, um, send it, rece receive it, and then, uh, and then, and then you know, go about your merry way, right? Um, there's actually a great presentation on that. I, I shamelessly have stolen that suggestion and implemented it many times. Um, that, that suggestion came from Andrew Betts from Financial Times Labs. So if you look at his presentation, he's got a great presentation on the batching of API calls. So um, if you look at uh, 3D animations versus 2D animations in CSS, most of the popular browsers nowadays do 3D. If you look at the performance differences between the two, um, 3D animations are vastly higher performing even for 2D operations. So don't take my word for it, just go to JSPerf or, or check out, check out, uh, check out uh, just Chrome Dev Tools and play around with it. So you can, uh, you can get a lot of performance benefits out of that. And then of course, at least for now, promises are your friends. Um, I tend to prefer async, but don't tell anybody. And then uh, the caveat to everything that I've said above with most of the JavaScript and CSS stuff is that Internet Explorer, at least the early versions, are pure evil, and most of it can't be implemented there, so you have to figure out shims and workarounds. So encourage your clients to put a knife in uh, Internet Explorer 8 and 9. So questions? Everybody just hungry? It all depends on the file size. Um, if the font loads with a, with a smaller file size and loads from a single, uh, if you're loading a web, web font from a single file versus loading, uh, loading a bunch of SVGs, then the web font is, you're, you're better off loading the single web font, right? If you're loading a bunch of SVGs, then each one of those HTTP calls has a bunch of overhead, right? You can have a single sprite file, right? So it, once again, it, it, it all depends, right? So I gave both of those options there because you can have an SVG sprite or a web font, and whichever one of those options works better for you, whichever one produces a smaller file size and, and better download speed to use, and just experiment you know, on your project. So one, sometimes there's, there's advantages to either approach. In case anybody has any questions, I have a mic here. Anybody? Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks.